Hi, I'm Jonas and welcome to Dave Takes It On. I'll be putting to Dave some questions I've seen posted on the YouTube channel recently. So let's get started. Why didn't Tesla warn its drivers ahead of the Chicago cold weather incident? You know, I saw that comment myself. I do read through the comments still. And it just amazes me sometimes what people expect. You see, the weather forecasts, they're out there to do that. They give us warnings beforehand. Over here in the UK, we don't get the sort of weather that you got in Chicago, but not far off it. We got down to minus 14. And all over the news for days beforehand was essential travel only. Don't go out in this weather. This is dangerous. You're risking your life. If you do go out, then you're going to be put at risk. So make sure you're fully equipped. Make sure you've got a full tank of fuel before you go. Make sure you've got a spade to dig you out in Wellingtons. Make sure if you get stuck in a drift or a traffic jam uh, that you've got warm clothing because your car might run out of fuel. We got warning after warning after warning about this. So is Tesla supposed to do this for you? Are they supposed to look up your address and send you a personal warning? Sorry, I'm getting a bit facetious here, but uh, that's ridiculous. Your warnings come from uh, the weather forecast for freezing temperatures. This was a, an Arctic bomb, I think they call it, where the Arctic ice comes, whatever it was. Uh, it's an exception, but you got down to some ridiculously low temperatures. But all this information is up available on the Tesla website all the time. It's also in your car, because in your Tesla car, you have a full work manual in there from Tesla. And it tells you all of this. It tells you that in the cold, you'll get less range. It tells you you do absolutely need to precondition your battery. Never turn up at a charger with a stone. All of this is in there already. So you haven't read that. You haven't understood it. You haven't learned about your car You've ignored the weather forecast and you're blaming Tesla for this freeze up? No. Uh, learn a bit more about your car. Do a bit of future planning. For me, if I was going out and I had to go out in those sort of temperatures, I would have charged the car up the night before, even if I had a 30 mile drive to do it. Go there when it's deserted, charge your car up, precondition on the way, and arrive home with an absolutely full battery. Uh, this is assuming you can't charge at home, uh, so that you don't need to go and visit a charger first thing in the morning. If you can charge at home, you should absolutely have charged your car right to the top as much as you can the night before, and you should have preconditioned both the cabin and the battery before you set off. And with a Tesla, you do that by telling the Tesla, I want to set off at this time. Tesla will do all the calculations for you. So a lot of this was uh, self-inflicted, I'm afraid. Uh, take a bit more responsibility. It's your car. You spent a lot of money on the car. Learn how it works properly. With governments relying so much on fuel duty, what will they do to replace it? Oh, one of my pet subjects is, how will they replace fuel duty? Well, the simple answer is, you can do it instantly. You could do it today. Just stop subsidising the oil industries. Our government is still paying billions of pounds in subsidies, grants and tax breaks to the fossil fuel industry. Why on earth, in this day and age, the industry has been going for 100 years? Have they not learnt how to do it using their own money? They report, report record profits year after year after year. And yet our government still seems to think that we have to subsidise them to make it worthwhile they're doing. This is ridiculous. The first thing the government ought to do, and they ought to do it today, is stop subsidising the fossil fuel industry. That will easily cover it. Uh, for longer term, there is a, a very valid point here. And that is that uh, we have roads to travel on. Uh, someone has to pay for those roads. If you're one who didn't drive, why would you pay for something that you don't use? Well, you could use that argument on the NHS. If you're fit and healthy all your life and you never use it, you're still paying for it. But uh, there, there will probably be in the future some sort of tax on your road usage. Uh, so a rate per mile or rate per thousand mile you drive in the air, whatever it is, uh, and it'll be applied as a fuel duty or a, um, a vehicle excise duty at some point in the future. We in EVs can't not pay for our roads. Yeah, the roads are there. They do need repairing, replacing and adding to. So we expect the government to do that. And we would expect as sensible drivers to actually pay for that. So 
fuel duty, get rid of the oil industry subsidies, and for what what's going to replace it, we're going to have one day some sort of um, price per mile for driving on our roads. Is it really realistic to avoid EV chargers at peak times? You know, I seem to have upset a few people with my answer to this one. I did a video recently uh, one asking people why on earth they queued. And I said, if I uh, was going to the supermarket, I wouldn't go on a Friday night at five o'clock because there's always queues. You never find a trolley and you can't get a parking space in the car park. If I was going for a McDonald's, I would never go half past five in the evening because that's when all the kids and parents and all everything go and they're absolutely heaving and the drive through has got a huge queue. So... I personally avoid queues, and as I said in many videos, I never stopped, I queued once last year while wanting to charge my car, and I don't remember queuing the year before. This year, I've never queued either. And that's because I turn up at the charging stations, the superchargers, uh, at a time when they're quiet. So, somebody asked me in the comments, I saw this one, who are these average drivers who have no reason to visit charges at peak times? And I would say everyone. Um, there are 168 hours in a week. The average UK driver does 8,000 miles, which is 140 mile a week. Your Tesla, whatever model you've got, your EV, whatever model you've got, will easily do 100, 150 mile in a week on that. So once a week, you've got to find an hour. Uh, Tesla average charging time is 25 minutes. This is from Tesla official over the whole world. They, they analyze and uh, record all of the times. So if you drive the average mileage, you've got to replace 140 miles once a week. And the average time to do that is 25 minutes. So out of 168 hours in a week, you have to find about half an hour plus however long it takes you to get to your nearest charger. And we're told no one in the country is further away than 40 miles from a, char a supercharger. I personally am four miles away from one. So if I couldn't charge at home, I've got a four mile drive to do to get to my nearest supercharger. I can sit there with a cup of coffee for 25 minutes. And I can be back home. I would suggest that if you can't, set aside just half an hour or an hour of your time in a week to make sure that you, when you charge your car, you're not going to be queuing up. I think you've got a serious problem with your work-life balance, and that needs looking at. You can go on the app. Some of the cars will do it. They'll tell you whether the charges are busy. And if I saw that a charger was busy, I wouldn't go there. I don't understand why people will drive to a charger, supercharger, whatever it is, knowing that it's full. Now, one of the latest surveys, it's been in one of my videos recently, and that is that um, the average time an EV charger is used today is three and a half hours. I posted photograph after photograph of me at a supercharger with just one car, mine, on the whole of 10, 15, 20 chargers. Most chargers, whatever they make, will have a busy time, they'll have a quiet time, and they'll have an absolutely deserted time. If you have any sense at all, you'll set aside half an hour, an hour out of your, when the chargers are super busy and they're accused, not do that, but use it when they're quiet. I don't understand the question. It, it beats me why people knowingly drive to somewhere where there's a queue. It takes all sorts, I suppose. Is there any news about vehicle to grid? Well, if you're a Tesla driver, it's probably not going to be anytime soon. You see, Elon really doesn't like it. And I'll tell you why, because even if you have a car that can do it, uh, you'll understand why he's decided for the moment not to do it. And the simple fact is that if you have a power blackout and your car is your backup battery, then if you go to work or if you go to visit someone or you go to the shops, you disconnect your car from the house and the house goes dark again. It's not the ideal solution. Now, it's great if your car's in the drive, you're not using it, and you're in for the night and your car can run it. But what happens if the uh, blackout is an extended one? It will eventually flatten the battery in your car. It'll take it down to a really low state of charge where either you physically have to turn this off yourself and turn your house off, or the car will do it for you because no car 
are doing it uh, V2G will ever drain the battery totally. So th it's not ideal to do V2G. However, there are uses for it. And it's, ve it's not vehicle to grid, it's vehicle to load. Now, the new Cybertruck, this has vehicle to load. In theory, this could run your house, uh, but it's not what it's meant for. Uh, vehicle to load on a pickup truck is absolutely standard. Uh, you run power tools off it, you run portable air compressors off it, you run all sorts of uh, things off uh, pickup trucks. And it's been a feature on pickup trucks for an awful long time. So if you're working on a site and the site has got no power, you 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 run your power tools off your car. Off, And these are petrol and diesel pickups, so they, they've had it for a long time. So when EVs came out, they also came out with vehicle to grid. But at the time, uh, Tesla didn't have a pickup truck. Now, with the launch of the Cybertruck, that has vehicle to load uh, facility. If you're not in a pickup, these have huge batteries. The Tesla Cybertruck is supposed to be around about 110, 115 kilowatt hours. And the F-150 is also over 100 kilowatt hours. So these are big batteries. Some of the Hyundai's and Kia's, they actually have vehicle to load as well. And you can take along, I don't know, a portable TV. You could take along a portable electric grill, whatever it is you want for a picnic, and you can go and have a picnic. But again, uh, if you set off and you've only got a, a certain amount of range in your car and you go up into the mountains for a picnic and then you run uh, TVs and kettles and all sorts of things off your car, uh, you stand the real risk of actually flattening your battery down to a state of charge where you can't even get home again. They're not ideal, uh, but I understand the principle of it. I don't expect it to see on any of Tesla cars in the future, uh, certainly not for two, three, four years. Um, I don't see a huge advantage. The Model 2 coming out, the Redwood, that will have a much smaller battery than the Model 3. So there, if you plug in a, a portable TV or something, you could flatten that really quickly. So I suspect we won't see it on Tesla cars. I suspect we'll see it on other cars, particularly Chinese cars. Uh, but you need to be really careful with it. Uh, you don't really want to run your home off it. Um, for most people, if you want to run your home off batteries, you'll get solar panels and you'll get a home battery storage, a bit Powerwall from Tesla or whichever brand you want. Run the two separately so that if you are running your house off your battery storage, your Powerwall, and you do need to nip out for work or to go to the shops or to pick up some water, whatever the situation is, you can go and the house remains uh, live. So I think the two will separate. Little bit of a gimmick to me, uh, be nice to have, but not really, not for the cost involved. How can I find Sainsbury's chargers when they're not on ZapMap? Okay, it's a very good point. Uh, one of the comments I read was that somebody up in the northeast had put in uh, Sainsbury chargers nearby and didn't get any uh, response, uh, didn't get any hits. Um, and that's probably because there's only about half a dozen or a dozen sites in the whole of the UK at the moment, and there wasn't one near you. Uh, in time, the, uh, the Sainsbury chargers will appear on ZapMap and other um, navigation aids to help you charging. Uh, they will appear on there. In time, uh, possibly they'll be added to your car so that you can see them on your whatever system you use for finding charges on your central display. Uh, but at the moment, if you go on the Tesla website and you click on the smart charge and then you look at locations, you'll see all of their locations. They're very clearly marked. Uh, so you need to do your homework before you set off and just be aware of where they are. If they're not in your area yet, they're not in your area yet. It doesn't matter whether they're on Zap, Zap Map or not. In time, they will. Where can I get 30p charging with an Ionic 5? Well, this came as a complete surprise to one of the one of my viewers who I met on on a meetup recently at Darwin Services on the M sixty five. He's got an Ionic five. He'd only had it a short while, and he'd never used public chargers. He charges at home, and he says he doesn't do long journeys, so he probably never will use um, public chargers. And that's fine. An awful lot of people are like that. However, because he was there, because I was there, I did ask him if he would go and charge up. And let's see how easy or difficult it is for him. He's never done it before. I've never charged a public charger. I didn't know what to expect. And the chargers at Darwin Services are Ionities. 
And Ionity often have a deal with uh, Hyundai and Kia uh, with some sort of discount. Anyway, because a long story short, he pulled up to the charger, he plugged it in, he said it went really smoothly, recognised his car instantly, and it came up on the screen as 30 pence and shocked him. He didn't know that. Now, what he said to me was he's not going to use it because it only costs him 7.5p at home. So this is still not for him. But what it does say is if he gets out on a road trip and has to charge, his first choice will be uh, an Ionity charger. These are Darwin at 350 kilowatts. So these are really, really well suited to Ionic 5 or, uh, EV, or EV5 or Ionic 6, EV6. Uh, so you need to find out. So one of the places you find out is when you buy your car, you can also go on the um, the manufacturer's website. Uh, or the easy way of doing it is just go and plug in and have a look and see what is, what happens. I found this recently at Aldi uh, in Leyland, uh, where it was advertised as a Shell Recharge uh, Associated uh, Charger, uh, and it was 85 pence a kilowatt hour in a in a um, fast charger, which was 11 kilowatts. Seemed a lot to me. Anyway, I went and tried it, and I found out it's, it's actually 25 pence a kilowatt hour is what I was charged. So that map is not always right. The charger's not always right. If it's your local charger, and if you're going to use it regularly, go try it and find out for yourself what it is. But also get in touch with your manufacturers. Some of them, like um, uh, Hyundai, uh, will offer you free charging. Renaults are famous for doing this, and so are uh, Nissan. If you've got a Nissan Leaf, all the Nissan dealers have a free charger. Now, they're only fast chargers, 7 kilowatts, maybe 11, it depends on the dealer. But if you've got a nearby Nissan dealer, and you can leave your car there for a few hours, you get a totally free charge. So you need to look at these offers, see what's available. And this is a little bit of the homework I keep saying about, is... Find out for yourself what's actually going on. Is it dangerous to use QR codes at chargers when people can replace them with links to malware? Yeah, this is an issue. This is not related to EVs. This is absolutely everything. There's an awful lot of people realise if you scan a QR code, you will just go straight to a site and they're capitalising on this. So there's a load of scams out there. So it applies to everything, not just uh, EVs. So the first thing I would suggest if you're going to use the QR code is just check it is the QR code that you're meant to. Most of them, they're not stuck on. Most of them are actually part of the device. So they're actually printed onto the plastic, so they're not stuck on. So if ever you see a stuck on uh, QR code, I, I personally wouldn't use it. Uh, the second thing, they do only take you to the uh, site that, you meant, that they're meant to take you to. So in the case of uh, Darwin Services with Ionity, uh, I did scan one of the QR codes, and that took me straight to the Ionity site, and that one was a genuine one. Uh, however... It only takes you to the site. It's a shortcut. So if I was at an Ionity uh, charging station and I wanted not to use the contactless or not to use an RFID or anything like that, but wanted to pay, I can get my smartphone out and I can type in Ionity and go to their website. I can type in charging and I can get through to their website and I can find the page where it says one-off secure payment. Yeah. Now, this is genuine. I'm on their website. I've got navigated through to the page, and this now is a secure site. You'll see the padlock up on the uh, top of the smartphone, uh, and these are safe. So if you don't want to set up an account or set up a, a RFID or anything like that, uh, use your smartphone. Just go on their website, go to the page where it says pay for a charge, and then click pay for a charge. It'll ask you for your contact details, the same as you would if you're going on Amazon or any other site where you want to buy something, and it's a secure transaction. So be aware, if you see a QR code that's not built into the plastic, I would definitely, definitely, definitely not use it. Well, thanks very much for watching. If you have enjoyed this video, please click the like button. And if you'd like to see more, please subscribe and click the notification bell so we can notify you next time we launch a video. And a massive thank you to all our Patreon supporters. It is your support that enables us to go out and make these videos for you. So thank you very much for your contribution. I'm Dave.